Okay, why don't we get started? Welcome everyone to Psychiatry Grand Rounds. My name is Suzanne Bird and I'm one of the Grand Rounds co-chairs and I'll be the timekeeper for today's lecture, which is our second lecture in the annual spring series. Uh, during the presentation, everyone but the speaker will be muted, but feel free to send questions via the Q&A button. That's not the chat button, but the Q&A button. We'll reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the lecture when I will field questions on your behalf to the speaker. And with that housekeeping out of the way, I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Jerry Rosenbaum, our department's emeritus chief, who will introduce today's presentation. Great, thank you, Suzanne. And everybody, uh, you're in for quite a treat today to hear uh, Franklin present on this topic. For well, those of you who don't know Franklin, he graduated the University of Massachusetts Medical School and did his residency here at Mass General and stayed on as a CL fellow and did work in the uh, cardiac psychiatry research program uh, before uh, uh, joining CATSD and, and, and performing other duties at uh, MGH. But Franklin really was um, an extraordinary find, uh, uh, especially for me. I, uh, um, without going into the origin story, we been endeavoring to build a program to understand how psychedelics change the brain. And lo and behold, we discover Franklin, who has had a many-year interest, deep expertise. Deep field around the world and uh, has had um, interesting experiences in training and so forth. And he's assumed the role as the head of uh, uh, training and education for this new psycho psychedelic institute. So uh, um, without further ado, let me introduce Franklin and we'll hear his talk on psychedelic psychiatry. All right, well, thank you so much, Jerry. And um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you everybody for joining. It's a, it's a great honor to be able to present to you. Um, I would say it's a, it's a great honor to be here, but I'm at home. So uh, Jerry was kind enough to put the ether dome in the background. So thank you for that as well. But um, yeah, so I wanted to give everyone a little bit of uh, my backstory before embarking on this talk. So psychedelics is something that I've been interested in for quite some time. I got particularly interested in psychedelics during medical school. And my time in medical school was in sort of the mid uh, uh, to late uh, 2000s. And that was really when there was this resurgence in psychedelic research that started flowering a lot of publications, uh, really starting uh, around 2008. So I was sort of following it, but interested more from an intellectual standpoint. But there weren't really <clears throat> initially any opportunities during residency to get involved. Um, but I ended up getting connected with Rick Doblin, who actually is gonna be next week's Grand Round speaker. Rick runs uh, MAPS, which is pursuing FDA approval for MDMA. Uh, for the treatment of PTSD. And when I was a third year resident, I ended up uh, having an opportunity to become trained as an MDMA therapist. And that experience was really what kind of uh, opened my mind and I think really solidified both my interest and my passion in this field. The training itself was mostly just watching video of MDMA therapy of people with really severe PTSD and seeing uh, sort of their process and seeing how they recovered and it really was one of the more inspiring things I've actually ever done. And so actually being able to see how psychedelics work in an experiential way kind of really uh, catalyzed my interest in this. And then lo and behold, uh, we've had sort of a serendipitous series of events with uh, a number of really fantastic people at MGH who uh, I'll go into a little bit at the end of this talk to sort of generate interest and uh, establishment of this new psychedelic institute. Um, and I'll just uh, mention, uh, I apologize, my voice may get a little bit scratchy. Um, if it's any testament to my passion to present to you on this, I actually was diagnosed last week with coronavirus. It's luckily a mild case, but um, just please forgive me if I have to clear my throat a couple of times during the talk. Um, it's sort of ironic, actually, uh, really the only symptom other than that that I have is anosmia. And the last time I gave grand rounds was uh, on olfactory disorders a couple of years ago. So in a sort of ironic twist. Um, but without further ado, uh, I'd like to present my talk to you. So uh, Charlie Grove last gave us a really nice summary of 
kind of the term psychedelic and went into uh, a lot of detail on kind of all the different terms that we've used over the many decades to describe what these drugs actually are. Um, he mentioned that his preferred term is hallucinogen, but also acknowledged that really kind of in the modern era of psychedelic research, psychedelic is actually the term that most people um, like to use. And it's definitely the term that I prefer. Uh, it means mind manifesting. It was coined in 1956. And in terms of what the word actually means, I like to think of um, psychedelics as kind of three main things that I've listed here. And I put them in this particular order on purpose. So the first is really this core feature that psychedelics produce a change in consciousness. And this is associated with the feeling of profundity, often that this is a transformative experience for the individual. Oftentimes people will feel that this has great spiritual importance or mystical importance or something that's really deeply personally meaningful uh, for the individual. And that I think is really kind of the core element of a psychedelic experience, particularly uh, in the regard that they're being pursued for therapeutic purposes. Alongside that is this kind of difficult concept of ego dissolution. And what do we mean by ego dissolution? What we're really talking about is uh, this sort of experience that the boundary between the self, where the self ends and the rest of the world begins, seems to be somewhat dissolved. And so people will often feel much more connected with other people, but they might also feel more connected with inanimate objects, with nature. But by and large, there's just this sort of decreased feeling of a sort of uh, defined self in the normal sense. And I think these two features, this change of consciousness and this ego dissolution, are generally what people in these clinical trials come away with as being really kind of the core features of what actually helps them uh, recover or have a, a positive or therapeutic experience. I put the sensory experiences down at the end here because that actually, um, that does happen. So you can experience synesthesia, there can be visual imagery or visual hallucination, but that really isn't the core feature um, of the psychedelic experience. And that's not really thought to be part of the main therapeutic benefit. I'll talk a little bit more about the therapy in a minute. But first I wanna go a little bit into um, talking about the pharmacology and the safety. Um, so really all psychedelics for the purposes uh, of clinical studies that have been pursued at least are pretty similar in the way they pharmacologically work. Okay, so the main difference in any psychedelic is really just the duration of effect. So this is a little bit of an overgeneralization, but for the most part, we're thinking of uh, time as being the main differentiator between these elements. So that ranges anywhere um, from LSD, which can be up to 12 hours long, which makes it a little bit more difficult to work with. You can imagine doing, uh, having to supervise a patient for 12 hours in a research setting is fairly difficult. Whereas psilocybin and ayahuasca tend to last more on the order of four to six hours. Uh, all of them work uh, pretty much the same. They exert their primary psychedelic effect by agonism at the serotonin type 2A receptor. And what you're seeing here on the right is a graph. This is a nice study done by Katrin Preller in Switzerland. Switzerland's actually uh, kind of at the forefront of psychedelic research. And you can see this is the, the y-axis is something called the altered states of consciousness scale. And that's just a scale that was devised to measure psychedelic uh, to quantify psychedelic experience. So you're looking at the purple line here uh, from hours three to six with subjects that have been given LSD. And then you're gonna see there's two lines down at the bottom that are superimposed and look essentially the same. They're scoring almost zero. One is placebo and the other are subjects that were treated with ketanserin before being given LSD. Ketanserin is a pure 5-HT2A antagonist. And what this graph is showing is that ketanserin completely prophylaxes the subject from having any psychedelic experience at all. So the primary effect has been pretty well established to be due to 5-HT2A agonism. There's obviously more to the story. Um, there's likely some downstream activity and effects uh, going on at the 5-HT1A receptor as well. How that's uh, impacting the actual subjective experience is not entirely clear, but most psychedelics to a certain extent are also partial agonists of this receptor. So this is another area of research that's being pursued. One thing that's interesting about the pharmacology of psychedelics is that these are, sub these are compounds that one cannot actually get biologically addicted to. You can't become dependent on psychedelics because after two or three back-to-back -back days of using psychedelics, there's actually 
a pretty steep tachyphylaxis that develops and lingers around for about a week to 10 days. And so people who've taken LSD three days in a row actually are completely locked out for at least a week from having any further psychedelic experience. So it's not known exactly how this occurs, uh, but this tachyphylaxis actually prevents them from being something that people typically become dependent on or can use uh, in any frequent fashion. Okay, so what about the physiologic effects of psychedelics? So it turns out that they're actually uh, physically on the body, they tend to be pretty benign. So uh, in many clinical studies, uh, the majority of subjects don't have uh, really any physical symptoms, but headache, nausea, and fatigue are the ones that people do report when they occur. And in some combination, that's reported by less than half of folks who have been in a number of different clinical trials. You might be expecting that there's a picture of serotonergic excess because of uh, the pharmacology, but really what we tend to see is sort of a very mild increase in blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, mild increase in heart rate of 10 to 20 beats per minute above baseline. Occasionally it's a very mild uh, temperature elevation, but this is not, uh, we don't usually see like a hyperpyrexia. Uh, but what we do see, which is uh, pretty classic for psychedelic ingestion and probably familiar to anyone who's worked in psychiatric emergency rooms is medriasis. So people who take a psychedelic will have very dilated pupils. And uh, usually if you check their reflexes, there's gonna be a little bit of hyperreflexia as well. Uh, but by and large, they're uh, very medically well tolerated, at least uh, so far. And there's been a number of studies looking at some fairly medically ill patients. So there's been uh, several studies uh, using uh, patients with a high metastatic burden from terminal cancer. There was a study published last year giving uh, low and moderate doses of LSD to geriatric patients uh, that found very little uh, any uh, somatic effects. And so overall, they tend to be very well tolerated from a physiological standpoint. There's actually not uh, an LD50 that's ever been established for any psychedelic compound, uh, at least the commonly used psychedelic compounds. I'll qualify that statement <clears throat> in a minute. Uh, but it's likely thought that for LSD and psilocybin, the LD50 is probably somewhere in the order of grams or kilograms. There's been reports of people who have not really had any effects, even with uh, pretty significant accidental ingestion. Uh, uh, of a psychedelic. And then finally, I just mentioned this uh, for those of you uh, who might be a little bit older in the audience. You might remember some of the, uh, the early waves of anti-drug campaigns back in the early 1970s. There were a lot of television ads showing mutated chromosomes, uh, uh, neurotoxicity. This actually has never been shown uh, in any actual uh, reliable or clinical study. Okay, so these are just some uh, screenshots. This is a study by Robin Carhart Harris up at the top here where they gave, uh, they say low dose, but it was more really low and moderate dose LSD to healthy older volunteers. This was published last year and they're now, uh, one of the uh, studies that they're going to be uh, pursuing is looking at uh, treating patients with Alzheimer's disease using LSD, but essentially establishing uh, safety and tolerability in this population. Down in the lower left here, we're just looking at uh, the curves from a psilocybin session. This was in a study of patients being treated for alcohol use disorder. And what you're seeing is over the course of six hours, the top you're seeing uh, systolic blood pressure elevation. Again, appreciable, but fairly mild. And then at the bottom, diastolic blood pressure elevation. Um, and then this organic, uh, organic chemistry picture here in the lower right um, is uh, the model, uh, the skeleton of the NBOMEs. Okay, so it turns out that not all psychedelics are actually created equal. So the commonly used psychedelics and the commonly studied psychedelics are the ones that I'm referring to, but there are some uh, more out in the world of research chemicals that actually can be quite harmful. The NBOME are a family of compounds that unfortunately in the last several years have made their way into being sold at concerts and raves and uh, in music festivals. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's put on blotter paper and sold as LSD. People take it. They don't know what they're ingesting. Um, and there's been a number of uh, some pretty significant medical illness. They can cause seizures and a number of fatalities. And so uh, most of the cases, actually, where people have ingested what they thought was LSD and had an adverse medical event have actually been due to one of these compounds. 25I down at the bottom is the most commonly used one. But it's, it's an unfortunate occurrence. And really, I think, demonstrates uh, the risks of uh, recreational use and uh, the lack of safety there. 
So what about psychological safety? I actually think this is something that makes psychedelics really interesting in terms of the fact that these are not drugs that we're really concerned for the most part about the effects on the body. We're actually much more concerned about the effects on the mind. And so what do we actually mean when we say bad trip? Well, we can really mean a variety of different things. So patients can have anxiety. There can be fear, panic, dysphoria. There can be a paranoid reaction. And this can occur in a variety of modalities. So people can have sensory experiences. There can be frightening illusions. The hallucinations can be frightening. There can be increased attention to body processes, sort of some uh, thematic fears and preoccupations, oftentimes uh, more personal and metaphysical concerns. So people can have very negative experiences or thoughts about themselves, um, or there can be very troubling thoughts about the world as evil forces, sort of nihilistic. And so how do we actually deal with these? Well, I'll talk to you a little bit in a few slides about the model of psychedelic psychotherapy, but really the primary intervention uh, in any research setting really has been interpersonal support. It's been using the therapist to help the patient get through this. Um, you know, these studies do have rescue drugs on hand, like usually a benzo and as a backup, a neuroleptic, but very rarely have these ever been used in the current wave of psychedelic research. Really, um, with enough preparation, it's thought that uh, the therapist's role is really to be able to sort of help the person get through this. What's also additionally interesting is, you know, we say bad trip, but oftentimes there could be one element of the trip that can actually be difficult or troubling. And patients or study subjects who've gone through this uh, very often will come out of it and uh, look back and sort of describe that the difficult part of the trip was actually the most helpful for them in terms of sort of getting through something difficult, achieving a personal breakthrough. And so oftentimes this kind of dysphoria might be more thought of as kind of what might be going on in a psychodynamic psychotherapy session where sort of the more difficult parts of that experience can actually be the most helpful. Okay, so there are some psychiatric risks though, and screening is very important. So I think we all uh, have certainly seen people who have developed either a psychotic episode or a manic episode, and it seems that that was temporally correlated uh, with perhaps ingesting a psychedelic weeks before this happened. Um, in research settings, this has only actually been documented once. This was back in the 1960s. But in general, it is considered uh, a potential risk. And in all of the modern studies, there's been very careful screening. And so anyone who has a personal history or a primary family history of having either bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, usually also psychotic depression, and affective psychosis, um, these patients are screened out and uh, not allowed to be in these studies because it is thought that there could be a potential risk to kind of unmasking a psychosis. Uh, I mentioned briefly HPPD here, that stands for Hallucinogen Persisting Perceptual Disorder. This is basically the term that we use, the clinical term for what the lay public refers to as flashbacks. Um, what's interesting is that this has been fairly well described in recreational use but there's never been a case of HPPD that's ever been seen following any clinical studies. And so whether that's just due to adequate screening um, or a sort of qualitative difference between psychedelic psychotherapy and a more recreational uh, consumption uh, remains to be uh, elicited. Then finally, catastrophic behaviors. Charlie Grove mentioned uh, this a little bit last week, but there certainly have been suicides. There's been, you know, patients can get very agitated. Um, certainly, uh, this has happened. When this happens, there's very intense media coverage of this, but it's, it's fairly well known. Um, but this only occurs in non-controlled settings, and I think this, you know, it speaks to the psychological risk of ingesting psychedelics in non-controlled settings, but also speaks to the importance of preparation, uh, of set and setting, and also of having the psychological support. And, you know, it turns out that these things are actually not simply limited uh, to research settings or to clinical settings. So there's a fair number of people who recreationally are using psychedelics, but they'll often actually have some of sort of baby system uh, during this. It's, it's called trip sitting, um, you know, to sort of help uh, get them through any of these difficult things that might come up. So finally, what's interesting about psychedelics, and I think one of the aspects of them that has really generated a lot of interest from uh, clinical research is that the effects seem to be so long lasting. And so subjects will report an increased well-being, an enhanced appreciation, 
increased openness. And the majority of subjects in controlled settings tend to report that the uh, experience taken as a whole was enriching or meaningful. And like I mentioned earlier, this is even if the session was marked by dysphoria. So if you want a good example of that, Matthew Johnson uh, published in 2018 a qualitative report of a nicotine study helping people quit smoking. And a lot of the subjects had some very negative experiences of themselves, but they actually reported that those negative experiences um, in sort of a, a transformative but not an aversive way were what really kind of catalyzed their ability to actually uh, kick their smoking habit. I just mentioned this is a study out of Hopkins down here at the bottom. This is a 14-month follow-up of a non-clinical sample. These are healthy volunteers, all of whom uh, were either religiously or spiritually inclined and had some sort of daily uh, practice. And over a year later, uh, over half of them reported that it was among the top five most personally meaningful experiences of their lives. And two-thirds of them reported that it was among the top five most spiritually significant experiences in their lives. And so there's seeming to be this pattern of something that sort of is long lasting, um, that leaves an imprint on the person, even after a single psychedelic session like this, uh, this study by Griffin. And so what is psychedelic psychotherapy? Um, so this term sort of arose in the late 1960s, but before that there was more of this notion of psycholytic psychotherapy. So initially the idea was more that you would give a low dose of a psychedelic break down the subjects, uh, break down the patient's ego defenses, and let psychoanalysis be a little bit more effective. That was sort of how uh, psychedelics were first used. Um, by the end of the 1960s, with a lot more psychedelic research, there came to be a different definition and a different notion of how these compounds might be used. And it came to be called psychedelic psychotherapy. And this kind of coincided with the rise of uh, transpersonal psychology, uh, spearheaded by folks like Abraham Maslow, who at that point was running the American Psychological Association. And this was really more oriented towards having the patient have a peak experience or a transcendent experience. And in psychedelic psychotherapy, the therapist's role is really more supportive. And the actual psychotherapy that occurs is actually more confined to the extensive preparation before. And then what are called the integration sessions after the psychedelic is given. And so the integration sessions are where the therapist discusses with the patient, helps them metabolize what happened, helps them sort of make meaning of the session. Um, unfortunately, I do feel uh, that I have to mention that back in the 60s in the first wave of research, there was a lot of unethical behavior and a lot of studies used neither model and really it wasn't therapy at all. <clears throat> um, patients were tied to beds, patients were not prepared, they weren't told really what they were being given, they were blindfolded. This is just an example here um, of subjects. These people were given with very little preparation, eight pads of LSD, which is an extraordinarily high dose of LSD. They were tied to the bed with posy belts, um, and they were a little worried that they were giving them so much LSD, they uh, felt that they had to give them phenytoin beforehand. And I'll just read the last line here. They said, a particularly large dose of lysergide was used in order to be certain that important effects were not missed by using minimal doses. Um, they could have given them one eighth of this dose, and that statement would have been true. So thankfully, uh, we're in a more ethical era now, and we're sort of back to this model of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So to talk just a little bit more about what this means, um, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy was developed by Stan Groff back in the 1960s. He was a psychoanalyst who worked at the Maryland Psychiatric Institute and really did thousands of LSD sessions, mostly with patients who had uh, end-of-life anxiety and depression from cancer. And his model is really the model that has been pursued in this current era of psychedelic research. Pretty much every study has used most of the elements, if not to a T, of what his recommendations were. So the idea of this psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is really that the therapist's role is to prepare the patient to be able to utilize the medication session. And so there's a lot of prepping the patient, particularly for what to do if there's some negative stuff that comes up, if there's dysphoria, if there's fear, if there's panic. Um, but the session itself really is not a therapy session. The therapist is there if they need to be to help the patient. But for the most part, the patient is kind of encouraged to have an internal experience and to help facilitate that internal experience rather than sort of looking at patterns on the wall and you know, sort of enjoying or laughing at hallucinations. They're, give, they're usually given, not mandatorily, but offered to wear eye shades and headphones with instrumental music. And that's 
really sort of the bulk of the experience in most of these studies is sort of the patients are sort of thinking and turning, uh, turning inwards, so to speak. Um, I mentioned set and setting. The set is uh, preparing the patient, sort of uh, uh, managing their expectations. The setting is also very important. So Charlie Grove last week talked about some of the difficulties in this. Most clinical studies obviously are done in hospital environments, but I think pretty much every study that's been done since the 1990s has paid some attention. And, you know, it's pretty impressive what can be done with a hospital room in about 20 minutes. People usually you know, have brought in uh, personal belongings to make a hospital bed look more like a bed at home, you know, a rug on the wall, at least a non-fluorescent light, drapes if possible. Um, this is actually obviously not a hospital environment, but this is one of the MAP study sites this is where uh, MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD is conducted. And MAPS actually really wanted to try to pursue mostly private practice sites. Rick might talk a little bit about this next week, but they really wanted to kind of maximize the setting aspect of this. Obviously, most studies are not able to sort of go to this level, but I think it is an important aspect that needs to be paid attention to for anyone sort of considering psychedelic research. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the clinical studies that have led to the generation of so much interest in psychedelics. Um, so this first study here, this was psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for treatment resistant depression. And this was a study done by Robin Carhart Harris. He's at Imperial College in London, which had the world's first psychedelic research center was inaugurated last April. Um, and again, this is an open label study but this study generated quite a bit of media attention. And this, uh, they took 20 subjects that had treatment resistant depression and gave them two oral doses of psilocybin. Now, I remember last week there was a question from the audience <clears throat> sort of asking about the spacing of the psychedelic sessions. So most studies will give, if they're giving more than one psychedelic session, usually they're spaced about four weeks apart. This study departed from that but the first dose was a 10 milligram dose of psilocybin. And that really is more of sort of a light moderate dose. So this was kind of a test dose to help orient the patient to sort of what the experience would be like. And then a week later, they gave them a much larger dose. So 25 milligrams of psilocybin is, uh, is on the significantly higher end and uh, like, likely to cause in most subjects a pretty significant psychedelic experience. And so what they did, they used this uh, psychedelic psychotherapy model. So there were preparatory sessions before, there were integration sessions after, there was music and uh, eye shades during uh, with the presence of the psychedelic therapist. And then they followed them weekly for the first five weeks and then at three months and five months. And what they found is that depression scores were significantly reduced at all time points. Now, again, this was um, an open label study. So we have to take these results with a grain of salt, but it's still pretty impressive. I want you to focus on the Beck depression here on the left, mean scores coming into the study at baseline were 34.5. So these were pretty significantly depressed subjects with a very significant drop of uh, over 22 points on the BDI at one week. Now, there's a little bit of a recrudescence at three months and six months, but you see that there is, or at least appearing to be this sustained effect. So this is kind of after one or one and a half psilocybin sessions, even six months out that there's this persistent effect. This is another study. This is from uh, a team in Brazil that's doing both a lot of interesting clinical work as well as neuroimaging work with ayahuasca. And they're really the only folks who've been studying ayahuasca, um, Paul Otto Fontes and Araujo. Uh, but this was actually a randomized controlled double-blinded trial conducted on an inpatient psychiatric unit. So they took 29 patients who had treatment-resistant depression and followed them for a week. Um, and what they found, they got significant significance for the response rate in the intervention group at day one, two, and then persisting at one week. Uh, they didn't quite reach significance for uh, full remission from the depression. But I think what's interesting about this is they actually did have a significant placebo effect early on. And then you can see with the blue line here, um, that the placebo group starts to have some recrudescence of symptoms out at day seven. So a lot more to come from this group as well. I'm not gonna go through all the studies on this slide, but this is an area that's particularly interested uh, to me. The use of psychedelics in treating patients who have depression and anxiety disorders at the end of life. And there's a number of 
uh, much larger studies going on right now, uh, including a multi-site study in the United States. But uh, the first person to actually study this was last week's speaker, Charlie Grove, so he published this in 2011. Uh, the second study is an open label one, it's from Switzerland, which allows compassionate use of psychedelics uh, for terminal patients. Um, but I want to focus on these two studies by Griffiths and Ross. So Griffiths is at Johns Hopkins, uh, Steve Ross is at NYU. And uh, these are a couple of nice studies published back in 2016. But what I want to focus on is these were both single psilocybin psychotherapy sessions with subjects who had either depression or anxiety disorders associated with a diagnosis of life-threatening cancer. And what they found is they followed them six months out. And at six months, 80% of subjects still had a significant decrease in symptoms. And this was after just a single psilocybin. And we see this pattern of sustained effects um, from just a single session. So obviously there needs to be larger studies and luckily there are, they're obviously uh, currently on hold because of uh, coronavirus. But I think we're gonna see a lot more of this in the next couple of years. Okay, so what about addiction? Um, it turns out that uh, alcohol use disorder uh, was actually one of the very first things that was ever studied in terms of the clinical potential of psychedelics, specifically LSD. So way back in the 1960s up in Saskatchewan, a psychiatrist named Abram Hoffer started studying LSD uh, treatment. It wasn't initially really using this therapy model that we talked about. And it's interesting because uh, the initial hypothesis was that psychedelics were horrible and that the psychedelic experience was so awful that it mimicked the experience of delirium tremens and basically would like put the patient into rock bottom and help them turn their life around and stop drinking. So meanwhile, unrelated really to uh, this research, Bill Wilson had heard about uh, some circles in California that were using LSD for more spiritual purposes. And because of his interest, he founded AA and his emphasis on kind of finding your higher power. He had a friend administer LSD to him in 1956. Bill Wilson became uh, aware after taking LSD that there was actually research going on in Canada uh, became very interested in using LSD for treating alcohol use disorder and actually for a time was advocating very strongly to Alcoholics Anonymous that they incorporate LSD treatment into the 12-step program. Um, this actually became very controversial. The leadership of AA wasn't quite sure what to do and obviously this didn't actually get built into it but uh, for a time this was uh, even a standard of care in parts of Canada. Uh, I'm just going to read you this quote of what Bill Wilson said. He said, I don't believe LSD has any miraculous property of transforming spiritually and emotionally sick people into healthy ones overnight. But he says, it can set up a shining goal on the positive side. After all, it is only a temporary ego reducer. The vision and insights given by LSD could create a large incentive, at least in a considerable number of people. And so this kind of ushered in this heyday in the 19, late 50s and early to mid 1960s studying LSD for alcohol use disorder. And what were the results of those? Well, so a team went back in 2012 and did a meta-analysis of six of the best designed trials they could find and actually found that there was an odds ratio of almost two for a beneficial effect of LSD psychotherapy for alcohol misuse. So they had to sort of stretch the boundaries of what that was because the definitions were obviously different according to different studies. Um, but certainly some promising evidence that this potentially could be helpful. So Michael Bogenschutz at uh, NYU, they also have sort of a, a, another psychedelic uh, research center that is soon to uh, formally be named, um, published this study in 2015. This is a proof of concept study looking at alcohol, uh, alcohol use disorder, alcohol dependence. So what they did, they took 10 participants over half of them were male with alcohol dependence. And they had kind of a flexible dosing schedule where they got one to two psilocybin sessions that were embedded into a formalized program of motivational enhancement therapy. And their primary drinking outcome was uh, percent heavy drinking days. Again, they used the same psychedelic psychotherapy model. There was preparation, there was debriefing afterwards. And the first psilocybin dose was at week four, second dose was at week eight. 
uh, which used two therapists. Uh, most of the studies used two therapists, by the way. And what did they find? Well, you can see uh, some, some pretty promising results here, uh, both percent drinking days and percent heavy drinking days uh, significantly decrease. And so again, this is just a proof of concept study. And they're actually currently doing a phase two double blind trial that is ongoing, probably gonna be a little bit more delayed uh, beyond October 2020, which is the original completion date, but more to come on, the, on this. Now, what about tobacco? So I mentioned this study by Matt Johnson. <clears throat> Matt Johnson works at John Hopkins and published this back in 2014. This was just an open label pilot for smoking cessation. So again, a lot of these studies you'll notice um, are open label, so we have to take them a little bit with a grain of salt. But some pretty impressive results from this study as well. Um, they used some fairly high doses of psilocybin, so they did an initial dose of 20 milligrams, which is moderate to high, and then a very high dose of 30 milligrams. And this is embedded into a 15-week CBT-based CBT smoking cessation program. Okay, so this is an interesting design. They basically gave them CBT for smoking cessation for a month. Then they had them set their target quit date for the day of their first psilocybin session, which was at week five. Then four weeks later, they gave them another psilocybin session. And at week 13, there was the option of having a third. This was 15 subjects. The mean number of quit attempts was six. And at six months, they found that 80% of them were abstinent from smoking. And this was uh, biologically verified from a urine analysis. And then they did a couple of follow-up studies. Um, again, open label, so we have to take it with a grain of salt, but I still think this is pretty impressive for something as tenacious as nicotine addiction. They found in a year, two thirds were abstinent and 60% uh, were abstinent at 30 months. Now, this is the study, uh, the paper that I mentioned. If you're interested in really learning more about kind of the qualitative experience of patients, uh, there's some really nice quotes of what people went through and how they feel that the session actually helped them quit smoking. So I'll read the middle one where the person says, I don't know if I really learned. It was more like letting back in stuff that I had blocked out. I don't think I changed my values. I just remembered more of them or just remember to honor them more or allow them more. And this is the paper uh, that I also encourage you to read if you're curious to see how um, some more negative experience or dysphoric reactions can actually be catalytic in helping people through these experiences. So there were a number of subjects who actually had what we might call bad trips and yet nonetheless it, this, they felt at least was what helped them quit smoking. So I'm going to briefly go through some of the putative mechanisms. Um, I think the question that's really on everybody's mind is why serotonin 2A? Like, why is this even possible? Why is there a system that exists in the brain where you can give a substance to produce these uh, fairly extraordinary experiences? And one of the theories, this is principally uh, put forth by Robin Carhart Harris in England, is that there is evidence for the fact that serotonin 2A receptors are involved in the, in the response to extreme stressors in the environment. This has been found in both animal studies as well as human studies. And it may be the fact that the 5-HT2A receptor system is a means of facilitating plasticity in response to extreme stress. This may confer some evolutionary benefit where when a creature or an organism is faced with something that challenges some very well pre-established patterns of behavior or thinking. Um, you face them with a stressor where they need to kind of unlearn a lot of things very quickly in order to survive. That this intense stress response might actually mediate brain plasticity to allow this unlearning, to allow new ways of thinking, new behaviors. And so that's just one general theory as to, as to why this might work, but there is some evidence to support it. Some other evidence that uh, that the amygdala may be involved. The amygdala is rich in 5-HT2A receptors. This connects the amygdala widely across the neocortex and seems to have a role in the amygdala in gating uh, the salience of incoming sensory stimuli. And this process itself seems to be regulated by the prefrontal cortex, also via 5-HT2A receptors. And so there may be, another theory is that there may be, um, particularly in the realm of depression and anxiety disorders, uh, there may be the situation where the amygdala and prefrontal cortex are allowing sort of 
to uh, reduce the brain's perception of negative stimuli, reduce that value, reduce uh, the fearfulness response. So a lot of you have probably heard about the default mode network. Um, this is probably uh, one of the leading theories as to how psychedelics may work. So the default mode network is one of the networks in the brain and it's primarily active when we're just daydreaming or when we're retrieving autobiographical memory. Default mode network is also involved really in our sense of self, our sense of embodiment. And it's thought to mediate the balance between internally and externally directed thoughts. So this is sort of our selfness network. And it turns out that the default mode network is involved in, among other things, pathological rumination and depression. Uh, there's also aberrant default mode network activity that's been described in substance abuse. And this is precisely the network that across multiple studies, including using psilocybin, using LSD, using ayahuasca, seems to be modulated by psychedelics. So the default mode network itself as an entire network seems to be turned off or to uh, the activity is reduced. And then the actual connectivity within different hubs of the default mode network also is reduced under the influence of psychedelics. And there's some evidence to suggest that the magnitude of that deactivation might correlate with the subjective effects of psychedelics. And so when you think about uh, psychedelics and back to how I was defining them, right, that this is among other things, this experience of ego dissolution, this uh, removal of the sense of self, this may be the mechanism by which that happens. So this is just a study um, out of Brazil. This is that same team. They were taking uh, 10 healthy subjects who are all ayahuasca experienced, and they did uh, fMRI before and after being given ayahuasca. So the second uh, fMRI study was done while they were actually on ayahuasca, and they found decreased bold signal in the default mode network hub. So you can see the medial prefrontal cortex up in the front there in the leftmost slice, and then the posterior cingulate in the back. Okay, this is the same study. They also found reduced functional connectivity within the network that was driven largely by the posterior cingulate there in the back. Um, interestingly, uh, psilocybin, but not ayahuasca, also caused decreased connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate. Again, these are two of the major hubs of the default mode network. So something seems to be going on there that correlates with the psychedelic experience. This is another study uh, by the Brazil team where they uh, took 50 healthy volunteers. This one just came out. And uh, unlike their previous studies, these were all ayahuasca naive subjects. Okay, and they found significant default mode network functional connectivity decreases within these hubs of posterior cingulate cortex, particularly for ayahuasca versus the placebo group. And so finally, what about future directions? So um, for anybody who's interested in uh, reading more about this topic, I would actually direct you to this really excellent review that just was published in February in the AJP on psychedelics and psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. So I think everybody, um, took notice of this that in this journal that there's finally this uh, a paper. It's been difficult for a lot of psychedelic researchers actually because of I think stigma primarily to get uh, some of these studies published. So there's only there's kind of a cadre of journals uh, up until this point that have been seen as uh, so-called psychedelics friendly. Uh, but 2019 really sort of marked a significant shift. So in 2019 we saw in April a psychedelic research center open at Imperial College in Oxford, followed by Johns Hopkins with a $17 million donation. Um, you're seeing down in the lower right here, Roland Griffiths and Matt Johnson of Johns Hopkins being interviewed on 60 Minutes by Anderson Cooper that a lot of you may have seen. And so I think 2019 really was kind of a watershed year. There's a number of studies that have been getting going. And so what about Mass General? Well, um, Sort of through, as Jerry alluded to, the serendipitous uh, turn of events, uh, a lot of people have come together, some really fantastic folks, over the last year and a half. And there's now a number of studies that are in various, uh, albeit early stages of uh, development and proposal, to uh, conduct some psychedelic research studies. And we have actually a whole team now of some really fantastic people. And uh, we're looking forward to actually opening uh, an MGH Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. And so we have Jerry Rosenbaum as the uh, 
director. Uh, Bruce Rosen is the scientific director for clinical neuroscience and neuroimaging. Steve Haggerty is scientific director of chemical neurobiology. Charman Ghaznavi, director of clinical studies, and I'll be uh, the director of training and education. One of my main uh, particular interests in this is uh, from the therapy therapy standpoint and how can we actually enhance these therapies and uh, build on the uh, established therapeutic model that we have. And so much more to come and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be having a lot more to talk about in the next couple of years. And so I'd like to stop now and we have about 15 minutes, I think, for questions. But um, thank you so much again. Thank you, Franklin. That was very clear and very interesting. Um, I'll give the audience a chance to send in some questions through the Q&A button. Um, I, I'll start off with one. I, I'm glad you referenced the AJP uh, article because I just read it recently. Um, and I was interested about the role of patient expectations in terms of people who would uh, consent to participate in some of these studies and how we think about the influence that that might have on their response. I mean, I think <clears throat> that kind of goes back to this, you know, really old term of set and setting. And I think kind of patient expectations would be considered part of the set. Um, I certainly think there can be, uh, you know, a, a component, obviously, of placebo response. So it's actually impressive, given how kind of extraordinary the effects of psychedelics can be. If you look at some of the better designed placebo-controlled studies, there's a number of patients who actually were given placebo who thought they'd been given the psychedelic, and a number of therapists in those studies who actually thought that the subject had been given a psychedelic when they were not. Um, but certainly, I think uh, the expectation plays a role. Um, but I also think that that's an important component of how you can actually use the uh, psychedelic as a medicine to facilitate mm -hmm. having the patient have a therapeutic experience. And that kind of goes into, you know, what are they actually doing this for? What do they hope to get out of it? And when the therapist comes in in the preparatory session, you know, somebody might come in and think that this is just a drug that's going to erase their depression. And we really don't think of it that way. It's really more that the, uh, these sessions are an experiential treatment more than it's simply like they're being given a pill that will make their symptoms go away. So sort of helping them manage those expectations, um, perhaps in a more realistic way, is also part of the therapist's role. Thank you. We have some questions that are coming in now. So I'll just uh, start with the first from Josh Rothman. Uh, who says, what do you make of the direction of the effects in the DMN, decreased connectivity as opposed to increased, and how this relates to therapeutic response? So I think we're probably not quite there yet, uh, Josh, to really come to any full conclusions as to how exactly the default mode network may be influencing this. Um, but I, I think in general, it does seem consistent that there's a reduction in activity and that that reduction seems to be correlated with the effect. There's that one study by Robin Carhart Harris where there was, I think it was short, like, you know, the next day after being given the psychedelic, there was found to be increased connectivity. Um, but that doesn't actually quite make a lot of sense. And so there's really a lot more to sort of figure out what that exactly is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Sorry about that. Um, another question from Dr. Pappas, have any directed therapies been tried with the use of psychedelics? Um, by directed therapies, uh, do you mean things that are more sort of like interventional therapies like CBT? Um, well, I'll, I'll assume that's what you mean. Um, there have been a few clinical trials that have either studied or are studying this. So there is a group in Canada that was trying to use uh, a structured, a more structured treatment using MDMA for PTSD. Uh, my understanding is that during the actual psychedelic session, the therapy has 
now kind of reverted to more of an open end model because it's very difficult to do directed therapies when patients are actually in the midst of a psychedelic experience. Now that doesn't mean that you can't enhance an existing therapy uh, model. And so there's a number of studies that are that have or are conducting CBT, like the smoking cessation study I mentioned, or the alcohol use disorder study using motivational enhancement or using CBT, and then trying to kind of boost that therapy with the psychedelic session. But I think in the midst of the actual psychedelic experience, it does become very difficult to do anything that's uh, very directive, although certain principles, particularly things that are kind of a little bit more on the edge of directive, like ACT, might have some potential. There's a group at Yale who's looking at ACT using psilocybin. Jonathan Worth also asks for PTSD. Do you lead patients to a triggering event as part of the therapy? Um, patients are not led to any particular event, but uh, I can say that a number of patients, and I think you know Rick would probably be the person next week who can talk a lot more about this, um, but that some element of sort of self-processing ended up occurring, at least in the MDMA sessions that I saw during training. So patients at some point in the session would just spontaneously often bring up and sort of process um, you know, whatever it was, their sentinel traumatic event. And it was really interesting seeing this because you would see these folks sort of talking about things that in most therapy sessions you would expect they would be sort of uh, quite emotionally fraught, but they were able to sort of talk about it with quite a bit of uh, emotional distance and yet not intellectualization. And that was one of the things that I sort of found very interesting seeing that. And from David Michelin, scientific interest aside, should we seek to attain some of these enlightened states you described here without hallucinogens? Do you think that can be achieved? <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that um, there is probably a lot more to be examined beyond simply the psychedelic experience. And that goes back to somebody that I mentioned in the talk, Abraham Maslow, who's probably more famous for the hierarchy of needs, but he published a little volume when he was really more interested in transpersonal psychology uh, about called Peak Experiences, I don't know, something that has peak experiences in it. And in that, he really talks about what I think a lot of the folks who developed this kind of model of psychedelic psychotherapy thought about, which is exactly that, that really the, uh, the experiential transformation element. And I think probably there's some unique aspects of psychedelics themselves, but I don't think that perhaps that type of transformation is limited to psychedelics. I think that it probably can be achieved and there's a lot more research to be done on alternative states that don't involve uh, drugs or medication. And from Maurizio Fava, we have a question. Given the results of the catanserin study, should we get patients on trazodone, which antagonizes 5-HT2A receptors, off of trazodone before trying psychedelics? Wow, so that's a, that's a really interesting question. I actually had not thought of that. Um, and I, I couldn't comment on that. I think uh, for psychedelic studies, I can say that patients are tapered off all of their psychotropic medication, uh, particularly SSRIs or any uh, standing antidepressants. So I don't think, as far as I know, we have any data of the interaction of uh, drugs like trazodone or nifazodone. Um, but I will comment briefly on just kind of the potential interaction. So you might think that uh, being on it, particularly on an SSRI, uh, that uh, taking a psychedelic might be risky because it would induce perhaps a, a hyperserotonergic state. But it, um, even though there's very little data on this, uh, many people uh, in sort of the psychedelic community have talked extensively for many years about the fact that uh, SSRIs seem to blunt the psychedelic experience. And so generally, that's another reason why people are taken off of that. Uh, I'm not specifically sure about trazodone. I would also just jump in on the topic of medication interaction. Uh, ayahuasca, uh, 
is a drug that is composed of DMT, which is not orally bioavailable because it's broken down by monoamine oxidase. So it's a brew that has one plant that has DMT and the other plant that has an MAO inhibitor in it. And it's very important for anybody, especially now that ayahuasca is sort of this bourgeois thing that people are doing in Manhattan or flying to South America, that people know about the potential risk of taking ayahuasca in particular with any serotonergic medication, because there have been some deaths from uh, uh, tired or from serotonin syndrome from that. Mm. And a question from Antonio Arseniegas. Would there be any value in creating a detailed retrospective survey on the use of psychedelics in the general population? Um, so there are a number of population studies. I think, you know, the, there's some interesting results, um, but I'm not sure how much you can glean from population studies with a lot of sort of methodological stuff, right, in terms of who's responding to them. Uh, potentially people that are more favorably disposed to psychedelics uh, might be preferentially responding. But there are some population surveys um, that have been published over the last couple of years. And in general, they have found that people who have used psychedelics tend to report sort of in general uh, a lesser amount of mental health conditions in general. But again, I think it's kind of limited amount of information that can be gleaned from that. And just one last question, it's gonna take us right up to the hour from Mark Fusanian. Do you have any thoughts on the therapeutic potential of extremely short acting psychedelic agents active over 20 to 30 minutes? Yeah, so I think you're probably talking about uh, DMT. So the DMT that's in ayahuasca, <clears throat> when it's combined with an MAOI, lasts for about four to six hours when taken orally. But DMT or dimethyltryptamine is also an extremely short acting psychedelic that can be administered intravenously or smoked. And so actually DMT was the very first uh, compound to be researched in the current wave. The first psychedelic paper in 30 years was published in 1996, and it looked at DMT. Um, so it basically produces a very, very short-acting, but very, very intense and possibly qualitatively different psychedelic experience that lasts not for 30 minutes, it lasts for more of like five to 10 minutes. So there is some research into sort of uh, a number of different things. You know, could this be used to terminate like a really acute depressive episode? Could we maybe use this in an emergency room setting to terminate suicidal ideation? Um, nobody has actually studied it in this regard, but there has been some discussion about that. I think that does it. Thank you so much, Franklin. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you to the audience and uh, everybody stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.